There is a section of Kansas in which I shall never be welcome. This is the reason for it. Frontier Gentlemen. Here with an Englishman's account of life and death in the West. As a reporter for the London Times, he writes his colorful and unusual stories. But as a man with a gun, he lives and becomes a part of the violent years in the new territories. Now, starring John Daner, this is the story of J.B. Kendall. Frontier Gentlemen. I had arrived in the town of Osawatomie by way of riverboat down the Missouri to Kansas City and then overland to this site of the famous battle. I hoped to write a story on the abolitionist John Brown, but two things prevented my doing so. The first was the weather. In a region where I was told the rain was plentiful, not a drop had fallen for more than three months. Eastern Kansas was in the grip of a severe drought. The second reason was Darby Bullman. I met him as I was doing a sketch of John Brown's cabin, he drew up in a wagon, got down, and peered over my shoulder, silent for a few minutes, then cleared his throat <coughs> and said, Hot, ain't it? Uh, yes, very. Ain't seasonal. And so I'm told. You a stranger around here? Mm-hmm. Me too. Just come in town. Ain't much to see, is there? No, not much. It's a pretty fair likeness of the cabin. <laughs> Thank you. Chimney don't seem to stick out just right, though. <laughs> you don't mind me saying. Well, it's... It's only a rough sketch. Ain't uh, squatty enough, neither. Outside of that, it ain't bad. Hmm. You, uh, make a living doing that? No. No, I'm a writer. This is, this is, this is a sideline. Oh, so. Are uh, you any good at making signs, uh, writing them? Well, I... I never... I'd be willing to pay two dollars. Won't go no higher than two. Don't need none of them fancy curlicues. Just a good old sign, nice and easy writing so folks can read it. Do it myself, except when I ain't much of a hand at that kind of thing. Well, uh, I... figure for two dollars you can draw in a picture along with the words. What kind of sign? Well, you write it out. I'll tell it to you slow. Well, all right. Just a minute. Let me... Uh... All right. Go on. Darby Bowman. Darby. D E. Uh, D-A-R. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Darby. Bullman. B-U-L-L. L-L-M-E-N. King of the Rainmakers. Mm. Of the Rainmakers. We'll guarantee to... We'll guarantee... To fix it to rain for the price of $1,000. Uh, well, would you prefer guarantee to bring forth rain for the price? Of... Fine, fine. Bring forth rain for the price, price of $1,000. Price of $1,000. That's yes. right, yes. Right. Now, what kind of a picture would you figure to draw with that? Well, what would you suggest? Oh, I don't know. Something good and wet, though. <laughs> Give them the idea. You're not serious, Mr. Uh, Bowman. Sure, I'm serious. You think I'm flapping my gums to make wind? You you can actually make it rain. I've been doing it now on five years. Well, how? Oh, I got my methods, mister. Don't you worry about that. A thousand dollars is a lot of money. Sure it is. But it's a sight less than what these homesuckers is going to lose if it don't rain. <laughs> Come to think of it, you know, I'll be needing an assistant. You want the job? Well, Pay I... you $50 in feed. Well, what are the, the requirements for an assistant? Oh, ain't nothing to it. You get that sign made. I got me a big roll of paper in the wagon yonder. Then we, we stick the sign up over the wagon and drive through the town. As soon as we get us a likely crowd gathered, I make the speech, and you wait to start the collection. Uh, a small point, but supposing they don't believe you? Ain't human nature not to believe me. Cows and crops is perishing for want of rain, ain't they? Yes. Uh -huh. A fellow like me comes along and gives them rain. <laughs> They'll believe me. Hmm. Have you ever failed? No, no, no. Mr. Oh, what's your name anyhow? Huh? Kendall. Oh, Kendall. You, you see that fellow coming this way herding them cows? Yes. Oh, wait, I'll, I'll, I'll show you what I mean. Get over there, you breach case of work. Morning, stranger. Morning. Them cows of yours kind of scrawny, ain't they? I 
Sure are, mister. Unless when we get some rain mighty soon, ain't gonna be no better than rawhide. Hey, and I guess your troubles is over, stranger. Well, that so? Yeah. You're talking to Darby Bowman, king of the rainmakers. Uh, this is my assistant, uh, 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 Slim Kendall. That so? Yes, sir. If you want a good big rain, you come on down to town at 5 o'clock. Tell your friends. I got the makings for the wettest rain you ever see. Bring it right down from the cloud. Ain't no cloud. Not right yet, there ain't. But that's what I aim to scare up. Hey, you be willing to pay maybe $50 for an inch of water in your fields? Mister, you do that, I'd be willing to pay a hundred. Oh, uh, I ain't a greedy man. Like I say, my wagon will be in the middle of the town at 5 o'clock. You tell your friends. I surely will, mister. I surely want to... Yeah. See the way it is, Kendall? I get me 20 fellas like that, pay $50 a piece, I get me a 1000 <laughs> But how can you guarantee that, I mean, what do they do if you can't produce the rain? Didn't you hear me get through telling him? It'll be the easiest $50 you ever made, Kendall. Now, you get going on that sign. I got to start mixing up the makings. Now, this here's going to be the wettest county in Kansas. Come tomorrow. Of all reading filters, cigarettes, can't filter that, can't filter that. It makes good sense when you smoke, can't, can't. Filters that of all other brands of cigarettes can't taste the best, can't taste the best. Correct your taste and all the rest can't filter that. I was torn between curiosity and common sense. The one counseled me to stay with Darby Bullman, to act in whatever assistant capacity he saw fit, and the other warned me to put as much distance as I could between the rainmaker and myself. So, common sense lost. I'm a newspaper correspondent, and there was something about the fat little man that intrigued me. So I made the sign, complete with a soaking wet landscape as a background. Bullman was immensely pleased. At exactly five o'clock, we drove the wagon into town, and drew up outside the sheriff's office. As for my instructions, I began beating on a large saucepan with a heavy iron spoon. Right. A small crowd began to gather. Right. Gather around, folks. Come in real close. Uh, that's a little slim. All right, gather around so they don't have to string my vitals. Uh, that's just fine, just fine. Now I guess you can all read so you know what that there sign says. Uh, we see what it says. We ain't so sure what it means, though. It means what it says, mister. I'm here to bring you rain. And when I say rain, I don't mean no tittle and spit. I mean a goose grounder. A regular gully washer. I mean to make it wet enough to bog a snipe. That's what it told me. That, that's what it said this morning. Yeah, let me go here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 What's your business, mister? Uh, you can read, can't you, friend? I ain't your friend, mister. I'm Sheriff Finnick. I aim to keep law and order in this here county. You creating a disturbance of the peace? Well, no such thing. Me and my assistant Slim, we're setting up a business deal. Like it says, $1,000 and I make rain. Ain't possible. You hear that? Sheriff says it ain't possible. Well, here's what I say. 24 hours. You give me 24 hours, and if there ain't a puddle of water in every pothole in this street, nobody pays me nothing. Bowman, we had fellas around these parts before claiming they could bring down weather. The last one got run out on a rail. I'm willing to take the medicine same as him, if and I don't make good. Yeah, thousand dollars, a heap of money. Sure is. You got proof you can do what you say? Where else you brung the rain? Where else? I'll tell you where. Out to California. I waited down the Sacramento Valley two years back so you could take a boat from Marysville down to Sacramento and never touch dry land. Hey, I don't see no harm if it's a guarantee. But uh, we got to make it legal like. Suits me. Anything you say. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Go over and fetch lawyer Woolsack. Tell him to come on over to the sheriff's office. We need some papers made. Now, I 
got it written up clear and understand it. Now, now, wait, just read it, will you? Well, uh, consideration of the mutual covenants herein contained, the parties hereto have agreed and do agree as follows. Wherefore and whereas. Uh, you can get over the wherefores and whereases, Collie. Uh, what do it say? In brief, a corporation in this town agrees to sell shares and to utilize such monies collected to pay Darby Bullman the sum of $1,000 upon delivery within 24 hours of one inch of natural waters. Uh. One half of the sum to be paid on signature of this document, and the other half to be paid when the task is completed. Mm. If rain is not forthcoming within the stipulated time, all money shall be returned by the party of the first part, etc., etc. <laughs> well, now that sounds mighty fine. What do you say, Slim? Clear and concise. Now, what ain't in the papers is what I'm telling you, Bowman. Now, if this here's some kind of gouging, you and your pal ain't gonna be in no condition to try it no more. You remember that. I ain't got time to worry about that, Sheriff. Let's sign them papers. I got a mess of work to do. Yeah. Sign right here. <laughs> That's my mark. Well, now, ain't that something? All that there big talk, he can't even write his name. His mark is perfectly legal, Sheriff. Now, you, sir. Uh, right you are. J. Mm. B. Canoodley. Uh, oh. Kendra. That's right. <clears throat> Excellent. Now, uh, I shall sign for the corporation. Kalia Woolsack. Let me through. Make way. Oh, we got trouble, boys. Sounds like Mrs. Cunningham. What is this I hear, Kalia Woolsack? Sheriff Finnick. Business affair, dear lady. Nothing to worry Don't about. Don't mealy him out, Mr. Woolsack. There's devil's work. Oh, oh no, no, Mrs. Finnick. No, I forbid it. I don't see how you rightly can forbid anything, ma'am. I got a contract here all signed legal like. It's the devil's work. Are you a man of temperance? If you mean, do I take a sup of snake poison? No, ma'am, I ain't a man of temperance. This town will not suffer the evils of intoxicating liquors, nor the workings of the devil. <laughs> I ain't no devil, ma'am. Uh, I think you misunderstand, madam. Uh, Mr. Bullman is not intoxicated. He's a rainmaker. You, sir, are in the presence of a lady. Uh, How dare you speak to me in that tone? Sheriff, I demand that you put a stop to this devil's work immediately. No, now, now, don't you worry about a thing, Mrs. Cunningham. There ain't gonna be no liquor nor carrying on, I promise you. It is against the laws of nature. Only the great rain maker up yonder has the right to create rain. I forbid you to attempt such a thing. The women's crusaders will be called out to put a stop to it. I warn you, Sheriff. Now, now, there ain't no need of that, Mrs. Cunningham. I have nothing more to say. We have put the devil out of Osawatomie. He will not return in the guise of these two wicked men. Liquor and sin. Liquor and sin. <coughs> Somebody's wife? Uh, not no more, Kendall. Uh, buried, too. Talked him to death, some say. I ain't having no trouble with Mary Elizabeth Cunningham or them women's crusaders. No, sir. Uh, you boys better get out of town. Well, we got a legal signed paper. Ain't that so, Slim? Uh, definitely so. Uh, there's no backing out of it, Sheriff. Less than you want to pay the thousand dollars by default. Just 24 hours is all I need, fellas. Maybe less. Then you'll have your reign. And that old female buzzer won't have nothing to say. Mister, you listen here to what I'm telling you. If you don't come through with that reign, I'll turn you both over to the women's crusaders. And what they'll do to you will make a lynching party seem like an evening social. You got 24 hours. If it's new, Plymouth's got it. Got it. The 59 Plymouth's got it if it's new. If it's new, if it's new. The 59 Plymouth is at your Plymouth dealers now. It's new, it's wonderful, and it's here. New styling to make your heart sing. Plymouth for 59 has that fine car look. New Fury models at new lower prices. New swivel seats. Swing you in when you enter, swing you out when you leave. New push-button heater, world's simplest temperature control. New Golden Commando V8, biggest engine in the low-price field. New Miramatic mirror, new automatic headlight dimmer, new sport deck, new everything. See the completely new 59 Plymouth. Drive the completely new 59 Plymouth at your Plymouth dealers now. Darby Bullman and I left the town and went to a field a mile or two away. The rainmaker scurried about, unloading sacks from the wagon, contents unknown. Then we wrestled two immense cauldrons down to the ground. 
While I built fires under the containers, Bullman emptied the sacks and began to stir in a liquid which he poured from large jars. A great cloud of dense smoke began to rise into the night, spreading, oily, black, and with it arose a most incredible stench. If nothing else, the heavens would weep at that alone. <laughs> what is it? My own chemical invention. Ain't nothing else like it. I should hope not. <laughs> There. That ought to do it. All we got to do now is to keep her good and hot and wait. Oh, she's rising just fine. Might get something sooner than I figured. Wind's right. Yes, sir, shouldn't be too long. We spent the night in the field, alternately napping and tending the fire. At dawn, there were only gray wisps rising from the cauldrons, and the sky was cloudless. Bullman whistled cheerfully as we loaded the wagon, then made our way back to the sheriff's office. Well, you don't seem particularly worried. <laughs> Ain't no reason I should be. You neither. From that sky, I'd say there wasn't any rain within a hundred miles. You'd say that, huh? Well, we got a few hours to go yet. Whoa, whoa. Morning, boys. Oh, morning. Mighty dry start for a rainy day. Yes, that's a fact. Here you was making lots of smoke down the road away. Old Har Har, he said there was a powerful stink when he took the cows out this morning. Oh, so? Some of the fellers ain't feeling so happy waking up this morning not finding no rain. That's so. Oh, morning, Sheriff. Morning. Well, mighty nice of you to save me the trouble of coming out to get you. Is something wrong, Sheriff? You know, doggone well, something's wrong. Another hour, this town's gonna be bellering for your skin. Rain. <laughs> Ain't gonna be no rain, you know it. 24 hours, like the paper says. Ain't but a mite after nine now. We still got uh, nine hours to go. Six o'clock this evening is finishing time. Well, I ain't taking no chances. Both of you's gonna be locked up. L why? Why? Because I'm sworn up hold of peace, that's why. Folks around here's having a bad time with this dry spell. They're touchy enough to get mean. And that Mrs. Cunningham and her crusader ladies, well, I don't want no trouble. You get in that cell and stay there. Yeah. <laughs> Ain't worth fretting, Slim. She'll rain by and by. Mm, inside. Wouldn't care to send in some breakfast, would you, Sheriff? I'll send out for some. Sheriff! Oh, there'll be trouble. A bunch of men up the street, they saw Bullman and Kendall come into your office. They're talking about trickery. They're, they're ugly, very ugly. I knew it. And my knew wife it. was at a meeting last night. The Crusaders. Mary Elizabeth Cunningham has got the women worked up. Mrs. Wolsock accused me of working with the devil. This sure must have been some town before that leaky mouth woman cleaned it up. Listen, they're coming. Now, look, a bargain's a bargain. We agreed 24 hours. Oh, you ain't sticking to that crazy talk, are you? You know there ain't gonna be no rain. If you're lucky, I can stop them from lynching you. Maybe just tarring and feathering will be enough for him. It's highly illegal. Highly illegal. Or my idea. I think you'd better unlock the cell. No, sir. You stay right there. He's off, boy. That ain't no good to get excited. We aim to keep them orange coats out and spring them up. There ain't no oh, rain. Not a lot of bad smell. My old oh, woman's got the heaves on account of that yeah, stink. Yeah, Turn them over to the sheriff. We'll take care of them. I just heard it came over the telegraph. Oh, it's raining. Rain, well, rain. All over. All over to Ottawa, well, down the line to Osage City, Lawrence, Topeka, Ka Kansas City. It's well, it raining. Ain't, it ain't raining here. Our contract specifically yeah. calls for rain in autonomy. And unless the provisions of the contract are... What was that? Well, it went my stomach, that's for sure. Hey, take a look out the window, boys. Where that cloud Where coming in. Hey, oh, 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 oh. Mr. Bullman, I'd say you are a very fortunate man. Ain't nothing fortunate about it. Purely scientific is all. Never fails. But uh, between you and me, it might be a good idea if we got out of here. Darby Bullman received the remainder of his fee, and in a torrent of rain, we drove out of Osawatomie. 
We didn't escape the downpour until the next day and were then some 50 miles south of the town. And from what I've heard, the storm lasted for three days. And the damage caused by the flooding river will long be remembered. As will the name of Darby Bullman. It's no surprise to anybody that the attractive and inexpensive new radios have proved popular. It's no surprise, that is, to anyone who listens to CBS radio. With so much in the way of music, comedy, drama, variety, and news coming your way every day on CBS radio, more than one radio around the house is more than a convenience. It's almost a necessity for anyone who has a daily routine. The man in the house wants to come home to an attractive home and an attractive wife. But household chores in themselves are rarely inspirational. The smart homemaker is one who refuses to let her regular responsibilities get her down. She gets her work done every day, but she gets her entertainment in, too. She has a radio in the kitchen as well as the living room. Chances are she has a portable radio as well to follow her from one task to another around the house. She knows why the inexpensive new radios are so popular. And she knows the value of CBS radio, too. Frontier Gentlemen was written, produced, and directed by Anthony Ellis and stars John Daner as J.P. Kendall. Featured in the cast were Joseph Kearns, Jack Crucian, Stacey Harris, Virginia Gregg, Charles Seal, and Jack Moyle. Join us again next week for another report from the Frontier Gentlemen. Bud Sewell speaking. Kansas, I found shelter for the night, which led to a number of rather awkward incidents. This is what happened. Frontier Gentlemen. Here with an Englishman's account of life and death in the West. As a reporter for the London Times, he writes his colorful and unusual stories. But as a man with a gun, he lives and becomes a part of the violent years in the new territories. Now, starring John Daner, this is the story of J.B. Kendall, Frontier Gentleman. friend Darby Bullman had offered to take me into partnership in a new venture, namely water divining, the discovery of hidden springs and wells by methods known only to Mr. Bullman. I declined with thanks and hastily set out alone for the town of Independence, which I knew to lie some 20 miles distant. I hoped to arrive before dark, but my horse had gone slightly lame, and I faced the depressing prospect of camping hungry in the steadily falling rain. But a few minutes later, I was cheered at the sight of a dim glow of light in the gathering dusk and came upon a frame building surrounded by a stand of willowy trees. I tied up my horse, knocked at the door. It was immediately opened by a pleasant-looking young man of about 20. Evening, sir. Good evening. You look a mite wet. Come on in. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, there's a store. Yes, sir. 
Not much of a one. Only place between Independence and Osage Mission for supplies. Ah. Where are you bound? Uh, Independence. Tonight? Well, if I can. I wouldn't try if I was you. Trail's washed out a couple of miles up the way. Less than you know it good, you can get bogged down pretty bad. Oh? Then, uh, would there be any possibility of putting up here for the night? Oh, I don't know. I'll have to ask Pa. Pa? Me and my Pa and Ma and Sally, we live in the back. Ain't a heap of room. Oh, well, I wouldn't want to put you out. The barn would be fine if you had one. We'll see what Pa says. We take care of travelers once in a while. Uh-huh. Ah, what is it, son? Fella here, his horse is lame, wants to know if we can bed him down for the night. My name is Kendall. I'd be very grateful. Uh, howdy. Albert Grover. This is my son, William. You don't mind a shakedown in the storeroom. It ain't the most comfortable. But... No, I'm sure it'll do nicely. William, tell your ma it's another place for dinner. Sure, Pa. Um, I'll want to pay you, of course. Well, I... I ain't exactly in the hotel business, but I reckon a dollar will take care of it. Bed and food. All right. Uh, thank you. Oh, and is there a place for the horse? William can put him in the barn. You better make it another 50 cents if you want feed for the horse. Oh, yes, of course. <clears throat> Where are you from? No particular place, just traveling. Salesman? Uh, newspaper correspondent. Got a foreign sound to your talk. <laughs> I came from England. Oh. You uh, got any tobacco to sell? New bales just come in. How much? Pound, I guess. A sack of flour and coffee. Pound. Don't mind waiting a minute, do you? I got to get the tobacco out of the storeroom. I'll wait. You want to come on back with me, Mr. Kendall? No, I'll get my saddlebag first. Sure. You do that. Well, mighty nice rain we're having, ain't it? Yes. (laughs) Mr. You a stranger in these parts? Yes. You figuring to stay here for the night? Yes. Don't do it. Don't? Why not? Listen, you think I'd have stopped off if I wasn't plumb out of provisions? Nobody in their right mind comes around the Grovers and they can help it. Oh? Why? I don't know all the why of it, but there's them say peculiar things happen. Things? Don't ask me what. I don't know. All I'm telling you is I've heard. That's all dark things. For example? That Mrs. Grover. You seen her? Not yet. Still-tongued woman. And a girl. They say she's got away with ghosts and the like. <laughs> ghosts? Go on, laugh. Maybe you'll laugh when you wake up murdered in the night. Oh, as bad as that, huh? There's folks been seen riding this way that's never been seen again. Murdered by the Grover family? There's talk. Obviously. I give you a warning. As soon as I get my provisions, I'm putting distance between me and this place. Even you got the sense you was born with, you'll do the same. Good evening. You're Mr. Kendall? Uh, yes, that's right. I'm Sally Grover. My brother says that you're staying with us tonight. Yes. My mother asks if you'll be satisfied with meat pie, or would you rather have a plate of beef? Oh, whichever is convenient. I don't want to put you into any trouble. No trouble. Mm-hmm. Meat pie, then. Thank you. I'll tell mother. Are you being attended, sir? Fine. I'm just fine. Yes, ma'am. Very well. Dinner will be in about a half an hour, Mr. Kendall. Thank you. You get a good look at them eyes. Mm-hmm. Rather nice eyes, I thought. Mister, you're plumb loco. They burn through you like a branding iron. Got a gun on you? Yes. Best keep it under your head tonight. No telling. Yes, I'll, I'll remember. Man, I'd have to be drunker than $700 to stay in this place tonight. Yeah, I'll accept your word for it. Now, if you'll excuse me, I want to take care of my horse. I sure wish you luck, mister. I surely do. Yes, the same to you. You, Mr. Kendall? Hmm? Uh, oh, <laughs> yes. Come out the back and get your horse better down. You want to lead him, I'll show you the way. Right. Sure is a big rain. About time, too. It's getting drier in the dust storm around here. Yes, yeah, so I've heard. <clears throat> what was that? What? It sounded like somebody crying out. <laughs> that. Yeah, I guess I'm so used to it, don't mean nothing. That's a little old owl up to the top of the barn. Guess he killed himself a mouse or something. Don't let that bother you none, Mr. Kendall. Come on, better get that horse of yours out of the wet unless he catches his death. Uh-huh. 
Of all reading filters, cigarettes can't filter best, can't filter best. It makes good sense when you smoke can't, can't filter best. Of all of the brands of cigarettes, can't taste the best, can't taste the best. A richer taste than all the rest, can't filter best. I left young William Grover to rub down the horse and feed him. By the time I returned to the house, the stranger had gone. I met Mrs. Grover, a tall, dark-haired woman, severe, unsmiling, and a few minutes later we were seated at the table eating an excellent meat pie. The father applied himself diligently to the task of eating. William chatted constantly, and Sally, olive-skinned, tall as her mother, quite beautiful, watched me across the table and an odd smile on her lips. I set eyes on him. I said, now that fellow, a handful around here, he's maybe town folks. And then he don't know the screech of an owl, and I'm sure of it. Ain't that so, Mr. Kennedy? <laughs> it was rather an odd sound. What sound? Owl in the barn. Be quiet, William. Oh, uh, no, we were taking my horse to the barn, Mrs. Grover. I thought I heard a cry. Your son told me about the owl in the barn. That was all. <laughs> More pie. You eat too fast, Albert. Which paper do you write, Mr. Kendall? The London Times. I never read the London Times. Sal, she's real educated, Mr. Kendall. Had school. She does a sight of reading. You believe in spirits, Mr. Kendall? Oh, uh, why, uh... Do you believe that the dead can return? <laughs> I've never given it much thought, Miss Grover. Don't let her get started, Mr. Kendall. William, you'll be needing more wood for the stove. Yes, Ma. And put on your hat. Keep the chill off your head, boy. Yes, Ma. Yeah. Mighty fine meat pie, Mother. Mmm. It's very good. If you'll finish, Mr. Kendall, mm. I'll take your plate. Thank you. Sally, the coffee. Uh, how come you're traveling this way, Kendall? You got friends and independence? No, it happens to be the closest town. I'm not quite sure what I'll do when I get there. Uh, what do you write? Mostly about things I've seen, the country, people. Have you ever written about things that you can't see? You know about such, Mr. Kendall? I'll no lecturing tonight, girl. Leave the man in peace. <laughs> Not at all, Mr. Grover. I'd like to discuss it. Uh, I don't have to listen. I got chores. What about your coffee? Later. I know you're not a believer. I can see it in your eyes, Mr. Kendall. Perhaps you can convince me, Miss Grover. You're laughing at me. Indeed, no. I'm most interested. You should be, Mr. Kendall. You only write of the living. There's more. I've written of the dead. There's still more. Tell me about it. I don't know for how long she talked. Strange thoughts. Half-formed ideas. Philosophies. I was conscious of the depth of her eyes and remembered the words of the stranger, like branding irons. Candlelight flickered on the wall, and I was suddenly aware that we were alone in the room. Mrs. Grover had disappeared. There was only the sound of the girl's voice, drum of rain, crackle of burning wood in the stove. Then she became silent. Nothing I've said. Nothing made you understand. The experiences... Things that have happened to you, they're quite possibly true. I think I'd have to see and hear for myself, though. People here believe in me. I've lectured for miles around. They're afraid of me, too. Is that good? If you knew, you'd be afraid. Is that what you want? People to fear you? I would have thought that a girl like you, pretty, intelligent... Pity. 
That's really all you see in me, isn't it? All any man sees. You'd like to make love to me. No. No, I don't think so. No? <laughs> You're a little too direct for me, Miss Grover. Why shouldn't I be direct? I'm different. I'm not like other women, am I? No. You're not. Perhaps in a way, it's a pity. If I were like the others, you'd want to make love to me? <laughs> You're not. You may kiss me. No. Why? Because you don't know how to behave like a woman. I don't understand. Well, someday you will. Why did you come here? My horse went lame. Raining. Too far to ride tonight. Go away. Why? I don't know. You're not like the others. Go away. What others? It's past time for your bed, Sally. You'll be wanting your own sleep, Mr. Kendall. Early to bed, early to rise. Makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. Good night. behind the wheel. That's all it takes to convince you that the 59 Plymouth's really got it. Got the newest of new design, new sport car handling ease, new fury performance, new get up and go. Just tell your Plymouth dealer you want to sample the go. Then you turn the key and Plymouth's new Golden Commando V8 leaps into life. Now you just push a button and go on your way to the most fun-filled 15 minutes of your driving life. See your Plymouth dealer. Take your fun drive in the 59 Plymouth real soon. You really go, go, go for a Plymouth, and Plymouth will really go for you. I lay on my cot in the cold little storeroom, shadows wavering on the wall in the uncertain light of the sputtering candle. Somewhere... A shutter rattled in a gust of wind. The rain had stopped. Only a dripping from the leafless trees. The wind. Uneasy sounds. And I felt under the blanket roll, which served as a pillow. Then I heard it. Somebody outside my door. I drew out my gun. The latch, slowly, slowly raising. Do you know how close you were to entering that spirit world of yours? Thought that you'd be asleep. No. I want you to go now. You said that before. Why? I can't tell you. Has it anything to do with what the stranger said to me before he left? Stranger? The man came in to buy provisions. He told me to leave, too. Warned me. About us? Yes. What did he say? Something about people disappearing. I gather that you and your family are not overly popular. You're not like the others, are you? What do you mean? I want to be like the woman you said I'm not. If I tell you... Will you go away? Will you take me with you? Tell me what. Shh. I want to be loved. I'm afraid of what I am. Take me with you. Tell me what. You're strong. You'll understand. It's not my fault. I want to go away. I've always wanted to. Others came here. They know about me because I'm pretty. You didn't come because of that, did you? He didn't either. 
He was a stranger, too. Who? Who? Over there. Behind the bales. The stranger I had seen a few hours earlier was lying huddled against the wall, surrounded by bales of tobacco, sacks of flour and sugar. His head had been smashed in, and his throat was cut. I sensed the girl at my shoulder. They didn't have time to take him outside. They were afraid you'd hear. See, you were in the barn. Why? You'll take me with you. Listen to me. Why have they done this? The money. They get yours, too. The others. You said there were others. Yes. How many? I don't remember. Will you take me with you now, before they come to do it? You murdered them? No. Pa and William, they do the killing. The others weren't like you, though. I didn't care if they died. I always had to die first. When are they coming for me? Do you know? Soon. Do they know that you're with me? Yes. We can go now before they come. I don't think so. They kill you. No. Yes. They're very good at it. What about your mother? She's not my mother. She's just a woman Pa married. I don't like her. Shh. Get over in the corner. Not a sound, you understand? You won't hurt me. Go on. Stay out of the way. Over here. Wait for the gun. Pa. Pa. He killed him. They're dead. But not really. Are you? Pa. William. He will come back. He'll come back. Get up. Come on, Sally. Get up. We go away now. You take me with you. If you're with me, they won't come back. They'll be afraid. Drop down your gun, Mr. Kendall. Come over to me, Sally. Ma, he's going to take me away. I want to go. Don't shoot him. You obey me, Sally. Get out of the way. No. No. I hate you. I'll kill you. Again. They all will. No, they won't hurt you anymore. You take me away now. Yes. I'll behave like a woman. I, I won't tell you kiss me. I'd like to. I want to. Yes. smiled, closed her eyes, and quietly died. When I went outside, the moon was out, the air smelled fresh and clean. And very faintly, I thought I heard the voice of a girl calling to me. Frontier Gentlemen was written, produced, and directed by Anthony Ellis and stars John Daner as J.B. Kendall. Featured in the cast were Virginia Gregg, Eddie Firestone, Parley Bear, Paula Winslow, and Vic Perrin. Join us again next week for another report from the Frontier Gentlemen. Bud Sewell speaking. Drive with care. Nobody has a life to spare. 
This is the CBS Radio Network. I saw a thousand people come to witness a living man's funeral. Frontier Gentlemen. Here with an Englishman's account of life and death in the West. As a reporter for the London Times, he writes his colorful and unusual stories. But as a man with a gun, he lives and becomes a part of the violent years in the new territories. Now, starring John Daner, this is the story of J.B. Kendall, Frontier Gentleman. Prior to the war between the states, Cole Williams and his band of Missouri Irregulars terrorized Kansas. He was reported to have been mortally wounded in his last monstrous raid, but his body was never found. So when I heard that a man said to be Cole Williams was dying in the river town of Batesville, Missouri, I traveled 300 miles in four days on the chance that I might get to talk to him. I found the man under personal guard of the sheriff in a room at the hotel. No, mister, I'm not letting anybody in that room that don't belong here. But, Sheriff, I'm a newspaper correspondent. It don't make no difference to me. My name is Kendall. I write for the London Times. It still don't cut anything with me. I ain't wearing him out on no newspaper man. (sighs) Then will you answer a few questions? You ask them, we'll see. Is the man really Cole Williams? Don't know yet. We all know this all around here is Bill Adams. We're waiting for someone who knew Williams to make sure. You say you've known him as Bill Adams. Does that mean that he's been living in Batesville? Uh, Twelve miles east of here. He's been working him some ground out there enough to keep himself fed. I see. Comes to town about twice a year. Hard for him, you know. How's that? He's crippled. Oh? Mm. He's got a bad hip. Had it ever since he first come here. Barely get on a horse. How'd that happen? Never said. Always kept to himself. I should think of sheriff. No, no, you're wrong there. Next question. How old a man is he? Mm, Doc and I figure about uh, 38, maybe 40. He won't tell us nothing. Well, this rumor that he is Cole Williams, just how did that start? Somebody left him outside my office four nights ago. Hey, what? That's right. He was real sick, and they just rode off and left him there. He'd stuck a note in his pocket saying he's Cole Williams. We don't know any more than that. Well, do you have any idea who brought him? We suspect a writer who's been seen going to Adams' place every now and again. Man probably come calling and found Adams where he is. Hmm. Is it true this man is dying? That's what the doc says. It's the rots. Rots? Swelling on the side of his chest, sore looking. Oh, what does the doctor say it is? The rots. He don't know any more about it than I do. Sheriff, may I... Would you let me in to ask him a few questions? No, I won't. But why? Are you through with me now? Well, he's able to talk, isn't he? Sometimes. It ain't that. Well, then may I just look at him? Did you know Williams? No. Then you ain't going in. I figured to keep him alive. Only persons to get in there is going to be them who knew Williams. I got important people coming. Official people. If he really is Cole Williams, there will be a lot of questions they'll want answered. Army men, I presume? Them and others. Mm. Officials from certain towns in Kansas? Them in particular. Yes, sir. I figure a lot of people from over there are going to want to know why he done them things. Why he and his men tore up their towns. 
Do you think he'll tell? Don't know. But he's dying. Maybe that'll make a difference. No, sir, Mr. Kendall. I'm going to keep him alive to find out. Now, you get on downstairs with the rest of the boys. coming from as far away as Dodge City in response to the rumor of Williams. I felt myself fortunate in securing the last available room at the hotel. My window looked out onto the street and I saw a group of army officers ride up, dismount, and go into the hotel. The first of the sheriff's important men had arrived. Knowing that if the man turned out to be Williams, my story would be of the greatest interest to American papers beside my readers in England, I decided to find the man to take my copy to Kansas City, the nearest wire terminus. In the saloon, I found a grinning little man with two of the requirements I needed, one of them being that he was drinking pure water. He followed me to my room to talk over my offer of a job. My name is Kendall. What's yours? Bandy is all I ever heard. <laughs> what kind of job you got for me? Mr. Bandy... I presume you're aware that a man said to be Cole Williams is dying in this hotel? Yeah, I heard it on the trail. Thought I'd come on over and maybe get to see him. I don't really want no job licked over. Uh, sit down, Mr. Bandy. Oh, oh, chairs is for dudes, Professor. I'll just hunker down here on the floor if it's all the same to you. Now, I want you to... Uh, I presume you ride, Mr. Bandy. Oh, horses, give me them legs, Major. Well, is it worth $25 to you to ride to Kansas City? I'd ride from here to California for that, but... I ain't going till this Williams thing is over. Why, he was just about the biggest killer Missouri ever had. If I'm here when he dies, <laughs> I'll have something to talk about on the trail for a long time. Oh, sir, you uh, you better get yourself another man. Well, I write for a paper, Mr. Bandy, and I want you to take my dispatch to Kansas City when Williams dies. Yeah, then we got another problem. It depends on how soon it happens. Why? Well, if he hangs on in the next week, we're smack into my drinking month. So. Well, I don't quite understand, but... My old mother taught me. She said, son, if you lay off drinking every other month, the old scamper juice will never get you. And she was right. Oh, I see. Well, then we've got... Six days, 19 hours, Major. After that, I won't know a horse from a hyena until the month's out. Yes. Well, there are other things you can do for me in the meantime, Mr. Bandy. And you will be one of the most important men in this whole affair. The little man's eyes lit up as I outlined his duties. He was to circulate among the crowd and bring people to my room who might have knowledge of Cole Williams. He agreed and left happily. I went back up to the dying man's room where I tried once again to gain entry but was stopped by the inomitable sheriff. The army men came out shortly and I asked them if they had been able to identify him. But they refused to talk to me other than saying he would not admit to being Cole Williams nor, of course, to any of the crimes attributed to Williams. I went back down to the lobby just as Bandy was starting up to find me. Hey, uh, Fisher, uh, I got something for you. Oh, yes, Bandy, what is it? You see that prairie hen sitting over there? Oh, well, this crowd, Bandy, I... No. Well, you ain't looking where I'm pointing. Over there, see? Oh, yes, yes, what about her? Talk to her. I heard her telling the sheriff men she'd know Williams. But they were too busy to pay any attention to it. Good work, Bandy. I'll talk to you later. Uh, pardon me. May I make it through here, please? Thank you. Uh, madam, I 
I wonder if I could talk to you a moment. No, please. Leave me alone. Well, I'm a newspaper correspondent, and I understand you'd be able to identify Cole Williams. Why, yes. Yes, I can. Those men wouldn't let me go up. Can you get me into the room? Possibly. Well, how is it that you would recognize Williams? He killed my husband. I'll know if it's him. She was pretty in her middle thirties and dressed all in black. I persuaded the sheriff's deputies to allow her to go to the dying man's room. The sheriff himself took her in while I waited in the corridor. When they returned, she was sobbing quietly, and he signaled me to take her downstairs. Instead, I offered to let her use my room to compose herself, and she accepted gratefully. Uh, sit here. Thank you. You're very kind. Twelve years I've waited to see Cole Williams dead. Twelve years. I was just sure this would be him. Are you certain it's not? This man's old, wrinkled. It's terrible to wish to see a man die. But I... I can't help wishing it were him. Would you... Could you tell me about it? I suppose a woman like me has no shame left, traveling all this way, hoping to see a man die. You're from Madison City, aren't you? Yes. Yes, I am. How did you know? And the things that happened there, I would say it was no lack of shame that drove you here. It was horrible. Two hundred of them. Beautiful morning. And two hundred murderers rode into our town. And he was the head of them. Yelling at them, cursing them if they didn't kill fast enough for him. He rode up to our house. Our house. And he had a smile on his face. While my husband went for his rifle, I ran out. And for a second I had hope because the man had a smile on his face. And he was he was wearing a flower in his hat. And I saw him stop and look at my garden. And he told his men not to ride across it. And I had hope. And he looked behind me. And his face changed. There was a shout. I screamed and turned and saw my husband. My lovely young husband with blood running out of his mouth. He died while I shouted at the man. The man who wouldn't step on my flowers. She was silent then for a long time. And in the darkening shadows, I walked to the window and stared out onto the street. I don't know how long I stood there, but it must have been some minutes, because when I turned, the woman had gone, and Bamboo was rushing into my room. Hey, Professor, you better get upstairs right away. The man's just been identified. It's Cole Williams, all right. It's him. <laughs> Fifteen minutes behind the wheel. That's all it takes to convince you that the 59 Plymouths really got it. Got the newest of new design, new sport car handling ease, new fury performance, new get up and go. Just tell your Plymouth dealer you want to sample the go. Then you turn the key and Plymouth's new Golden Commander V8 leaps into life. Now you just push a button and go on your way to the most fun-filled 15 minutes of your driving life. See your Plymouth dealer. Take your fun drive in the 59 Plymouth real soon. You really go, don't go for a Plymouth, and Plymouth will really go for you. For the first time since I'd arrived in Batesville, the crowd downstairs was silent. I knew that they were waiting for more news of Williams. I was on my way up the stairs when once again the sheriff stopped me. I can let you in a little later, Kendall. He won't talk to none of the people I've sent in there anyway. Then it is Williams? Oh, it's him, all right. His mother's in there now. Williams' mother? 
Do you remember the man I said we suspected of leaving Williams outside my office? Yeah. He Brunner. His name's Shad Barlow. Went to visit Williams, seen how sick he was, left him at my place, and headed out for the old lady. Says he used to ride with Cole. Uh, they asked me to leave for a while. The old lady's crying gobs all over him. Where can I get a drink? Downstairs, Barlow. Uh, Mr. Barlow, I'd like to buy you a drink. I'd rather go someplace by myself, Mr. Well, how about my room, then? I have a bottle of good rye there. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that'd be better than that saloon. All them vultures down there waiting for Cole to die so they can have a celebration. Chad Barlow was a tall man with arms that were too long. He seemed to welcome the grayness of my room, so I didn't bother to light a lamp. As I poured him a glass of rye, he seated himself awkwardly in a straight-backed chair by the window and for a long time watched the street below. I told him my name, that I was a newspaper correspondent, and that I would welcome anything he would be willing to tell me about Cole Williams. He didn't seem to hear me, and the crowd below in the saloon began their celebration. Suddenly he got up, walked to the dresser, and poured another glass of rye. Kids out of school declare a holiday. Cole Williams is dying in our town. I should never have brought him in. I thought they'd help him. Will you tell me about him, Barlow? Why? Why should I? You're his friend. I'm a newspaper correspondent. Mm. It's been so long now, I guess it don't make no difference. You got to remember one thing, though. What would you say your name was? Kendall. You got to remember one thing, Kendall. Yes. Yeah. There was a war going on. I don't mean the big thing. I mean a long time before that, there was a war out here. Why, clear back into the 50s, there was raids. Kansans into Missouri, Missourians into Kansas, back and forth. What Cole done was to organize his sons. Yeah, yeah, that was it. Dead men fighting through their sons. <laughs> I, I was just thinking. There ain't never been a better-looking Johnny Reb sat a horse than Cole. Nothing like what's upstairs. You'd never know that was him. Why, I've seen Cole charging down a hill, a hooting and a hollering, and telling us not to worry that nobody could touch us. <laughs> oh, Cole, you know, he was a funny one. Always wore a flower stuck in his hat brim when we went on them raids. Said it brought him good luck. Why, the, the day we took Madison City, we all stood on that hill for ten minutes waiting for him to find a posy. Well, maybe it was good luck. I don't know told me one time he wore it on account of his brother. His brother? Sure. He had a younger brother who loved flowers. He wrote a little patch of them on the side of the Williams house. Then one day the red legs came, the, the Kansans. They come riding in this day and tromped all over the kid's flowers, mean-like, just looking to jayhawk somebody. Cole's brother ran out to tell him to get, and they shot him down. Cole was, what, 26? 25 or 26. He was away, and when he come back, well, it sure made him mad, real mad, for a long time. But I guess he's got over that by now. Has he? I'm just wishing now I hadn't come to see Cole. He just died out there at his place all by himself. Why? He was your friend. Oh, and people downstairs. Most of them are glad he's dying. They just come to make sure... Yeah. Besides, I kind of put them years away. Like a saddle you don't use anymore. If you go and get it out, you find the tree all shot and full of worm holes. When he dies, what'll they do with him? I mean, it, it won't be a law planting, will it? I don't know. Sure wish I could take him. You? Sure. I'd take him, I'd give him a laugh. He used to always say, boys, if it happens to me in this next fight, do me a favor and throw me in a hole in Kansas. That'll teach him. <laughs> then he'd laugh and we'd go on in it. But I don't suppose they'll let me have him, will they? I doubt it. Maybe I'm just drunk, Kendall. Your bottle's nearly dry. Can I buy you one? No. No, thank you. Really? Funny how wrong a man can be. I, I thought I'd be getting cold something decent, not not this. He don't need me no more. I'm getting out of this town. 
remember one thing, Candle. There's two sides to everything. Don't let these Titans kill us, Tom Peachy. No. I won't. I watched from the window as Shad Barlow slowly rode out of Batesville. At the end of the main street, I thought he turned and looked back, but it was too dark to be sure. Concerning the actual death of Cole Williams, I can say this. There was much speculation in the saloons and streets as to whether he would admit to his crimes. I was there when he died, and for the second time since I'd come to Batesville, the town was silent. The room was crowded with men waiting for an admission of guilt or at least some sign of remorse. His mother was there, a tall, spare woman. Ma. Ma, are you still there? I'm here, Cole. Don't try to talk no more. Just lie quiet. Uh, how's brother? Is he going to live? Cole never done a thing. All these people standing around. He was the best boy a mother could have. Don't cry, Ma. Brother will be all right. The red legs didn't give him no chance. But don't cry. I'll fix him. I pro- promise I'll He's gone. Let him know in the street. The tired woman walked out of the room while someone signaled to the street that Cole Williams was dead. Getting away from it all is a big part of everybody's dream. Still, nobody wants to come back from a weekend like Rip Van Winkle, so completely at sea about what went on during his absence that he couldn't find a place for himself in his old hometown. Well, fortunately, you don't have to come back from a Rip Van Winkle, no matter how far you go from civilization over Saturday and Sunday. Take a radio with you, and wherever you are, whatever you're doing, CBS Radio will tune you in on the world you've left behind. With your dial set for your local affiliated CBS Radio station... The CBS News Department brings you fast, efficient, comprehensive reports at regular intervals all week long. CBS newsmen all over the nation and the world are trained and seasoned at sifting the trivial from the important. Make CBS Radio your window in the world while you're on your weekend jaunts, and you won't have to pay any penalty on your return for getting away from it all for a while. Gentlemen was produced and directed by Anthony Ellis. The night script was written by Tom Henley and stars John Daner as J.B. Kendall. Featured in the cast were Harry Bartell, Richard Perkins, Joseph Kearns, Virginia Gregg, Helen Cleave, and Jack Moyle. Join us again next week for another report from the Frontier Gentlemen. Bud Sewell speaking. Drive with care. Nobody has a life to spare. This is the CBS Radio Network. It occurs to me that in this, my last report to the London Times, there are many incidents which I have omitted, things seen and heard during these several months of my journeys through the American West. Here, then, some random notes. Frontier, gentlemen. an Englishman's account of life and death in the West. As a reporter for the London Times, he writes his colorful and unusual stories. But as a man with a gun, he lives and becomes a part of the violent years in the new territories. Now, starring John Daner, this is the story of J.B. Kendall, 
Frontier Gentlemen. These notes are being written as I journey by train to New York. From there, I shall board a ship for England and home. I recall in the Montana Territory town of Helena, a tall gentleman in high hat, black broadcloth frock coat, a dirty shirt with a torn paper collar, and the most singularly unpressed pair of nankeen trousers. He stood outside a saloon with a small case of bottles set before him. About a dozen men and women were crowded around, and a small yellow dog slumbered at his feet. Yes, sir, yes, lady, it's here. Here in this little bottle. Magic, you ask? No, say I, not magic. Pollock's original Mameluke liniment, a sovereign remedy for man and beast. It is confidently recommended to the afflicted as an infallible remedy for the following diseases. To wit, burns, cramps, pains in the joints, sore throat, frosted feet, rheumatism, spinal complaints, lumbago, old sores, cuts, bruises, swellings, sprains, pains in the back or sides, headache, cutaneous affections, ague cake, bites of insects or reptiles, salt room, mange, cracked hands, tetter, dysentery, cholera morbus, and cholera. What about the heaves, messer? Oh, the heaves you are, sir. And in this bottle, the answer to your question, sir. Pollock's syrup of sassafras, a cure. Nature's noblest remedy for heaves, consumption bronchitis, group or hives, colds, coughs, asthma, hoarseness, difficulty of breathing, purifying the blood, whooping cough, and a dozen ailments too horrible to mention. Ladies and gentlemen, it costs only 25 cents for one bottle. Or as an added inducement for your health, ladies and gentlemen, Pollock's original Mameluke liniment and a bottle of Pollock's syrup of sassafras, both for the small sum of 40 cents. Think of the dollars and suffering you will save by this miraculous movement. I remember the duel fought between two ladies, rivals for the dubious hand of a swaggering young Lothario named Court Thompson. The entire town turned out for the event. The duelists were Matty Silks and Katie Fulton. They were to fire at ten paces, and all was in readiness. Well, sir, if you ask me, my money's on Matty. Matty? Why, sure, everybody knows Matty Silks. You mean you ain't visited? No. I got ten dollars since you blow Katie Fulton's bustle clean out of the county. Aside from Court Thompson, Matty ain't standing for Katie's bar being on the same street. That's real bad feeling there. Well, which is Court Thompson? The feller standing next to Matty. Oh, he's a one. He is. Uh, you got to excuse me now, mister. I've been selected to count off the steps. All right, folks. Stay back. Let's get out of here, dole of honor. Matty, Katie, you know the rules. Ten paces and I count three and you start shooting. Let's go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ready, ladies? One, two, three. You killed me! I'm shot! It was Katie Fulton's shot that missed Matty Silks and hit Court Thompson. Some said she'd done it purposely. Others argued that it was an accident. At any rate, Matty took the wounded Don Juan home, and as far as I know, their love burgeoned from that moment on. I shall continue these notes after the next stop, which is Chicago. <laughs> I remember an old 
one man, a miner I met in Fort Benton. His name was Shorthorn Tong. On our journey to locate his lost mine, he gave me an insight into Western speech, which I have found to be most valuable. He was leading a balky mule along a winding trail, and the air was blue with invective. <coughs> oh, it ain't really cussing. This sort of air in your lungs. Now, you take that mule. I call him a son of a gun. Now, that ain't rightly so, because anybody can see he ain't nothing but a son of a mule. <laughs> but he's a no good son of a gun, because that's the way it goes, see? Uh, yes, yes, I, I follow you. Now, speaking of that, what exactly is son of a gun stew? Son of a gun stew? Yes. Shucks, I'll tell you. <laughs> that's just about the best thing a man ever put in his insides. It's got brains and sweet breads. Oh, gotta be fresh killed cat, gotta be. And tongue, liver, light, heart, kidney. Oh, I tell you, mister, that is a something. <laughs> That's better than pooch any day. Yes, sir, when I find this claim, I'm gonna get me a set of store bought teeth. And I'll show you how to make a son of a gun stew. <laughs> you throw everything in except the hair, horns, and holler. Oh, <laughs> That's a real grub. Yes, it sounds... <laughs> Tell me, what's a hard tail? Oh, it's just a mule. Like this ornery stump sucking son of a gun. A hard tail mule. Hear it. Stump sucker? Ha! Ain't you never seen a horse getting his teeth against something and sucking wind? That's what a stump sucker is. Oh, you don't want nothing to do with a critter like that. <clears throat> no, sir. No. I've heard the expression riding herd on a woman. <laughs> That's courting, riding herds, courting. <laughs> Boy, you stick around old shorthorn Tom, he'll have you talking smart as a bunkhouse rat. Gee, you know what we call a fellow like you, green from the east? Tenderfoot, button, dude, prune picker, pilgrim, softhorn, greener. <laughs> what about you? Me? A rawhide, coffee cooler, pocket hunter, river sniper. Of course, fellas got me a lot of other things, too. <laughs> It don't really matter what they call you. It's what you are that counts. Now, I take you for a good partner, mister. Real good. Shorthorn Tom never did find his lost mine. He died up in the Highwood Mountains. I was with him. Then there was the performance of a fellow that I witnessed in Kansas, the Frontier Theatrical Players. Othello was a fine, powerful fellow with a broad Texas accent. A cowhand, recruited by the wife of a ranch owner. And needless to say, the wife played Desdemona. Unfortunately, Othello had a scant three days in which to memorize his part. The resultant scene I report verbatim. And that handkerchief which I give, give to you, I give it to Cassio. No, by my life and soul, send for the man and ask him. No, I don't want no sweet talk, honey. He all take you to perjury because you aren't on thy deathbed. I, but not yet to die. Yeah. So you confess freely about all that sinning. For, for... For to deny. For to deny each article with oath cannot remove or choke. Uh, something, something that I do grunt. Honey, you all gonna die. Mercy. Amen. And have you mercy, too? I never did offend you in my life. Never loved Cassio, but with such general warranty of heaven as I might now, love, I look, never give him I token. Saw, I saw, you know, the handkerchief, everything, I saw he, it. Uh, he found it, then. I never gave it him. Send for him hither. Let well, him... Well, confess. What, my lord? Well, you know, he... Uh, he been dealing off he of the Bible. He will not say so. He won't for a fact. Honest Yago stopped his mouth. Oh, my fear interprets. What is he, dead? And all of his hair been lied. My great revenge had stomach for all of them. Alas, he is betrayed and I undone. Now, Trump, weeps thou for him in my face? Oh, banish me, my lord, but not kill me. Now, Trump. Kill me tomorrow. Let me live tonight. No, sir. But half an hour. Being done, there is no pause. But while I say one it's prayer. It's too late. <laughs> you take your hands on this food, sir. I'll come up there and rip the hide off. Oh, yeah. Player's conclusion had deviated somewhat from Shakespeare's intent, but I found it nonetheless dramatic. I've often wondered whether the Texas Othello continued his thespian career. He could have made a fortune in London. Uh, speaking of fortunes reminds me of an extraordinary thing that happened in Montana Territory. I shall note it down after dinner. <laughs> Come in your way, my temptable 
Now at last, a U.S. car that's sized just right for the needs and tastes of the times. It's the Lark by Studebaker, your new dimension in motoring. The Lark gives you big car spaciousness on the inside, it's seat six, and small car convenience on the outside. It's nearly three feet shorter than conventional cars. Smartly styled, beautifully engineered, the Lark looks better and drives better than many expensive cars, yet costs less to buy, far less to operate. It's your new dimension. In motoring today, it's the Lark by Studebaker. See it today, the Lark. I mentioned an event in Montana Territory. But it happened to a Chinese gentleman named Li Chang. He was a well-educated man, scrupulously honest, and ran a general supply store in Helena. During a few days of my visit, I had enjoyed several cups of tea and one or two chess games with him. I remember that one afternoon, he seemed quite excited. His hand shook as he poured the tea. This is a momentous day for me, my friend Kendall. Oh? You are the first to know. I am a mine owner. No. Look. A legal document which gives me possession of the lucky hand plus a claim. I have paid for it with my life's earnings, $40,000. You know that uh, some men have been bringing me their gold dust to keep for them, as in a bank? Yes, I remember you telling me. Uh, it was their claim that I bought. Uh, it took much time, much trade talk, but finally they agreed to sell. Now I am a mine owner. As soon as I have made my fortune, Kendall, I shall return to China. I live the remainder of my life in peace and security. Li Chao was evidently the last or next to last man in Helena to find out what had happened. I heard it three days later from the barber who was shaving me. Hey, mister, it's the biggest joke in Helena since old man Hornaday strung up that mule for kicking his wife. You mean you ain't heard? No. Yeah, a Chinese gent along the street, Lee Chow, bought himself from mine. Yes, I know. You know it's salted? Salted? He's paid 40000 for a salted mine. What the boy's done was to take him a bag of gold dust every day to hold for him. Lee figures they got a whopper claim. He wants to buy in partners. No, sir, says they. And then when Lee's prime real good, the boys figure is how they've done enough work, they're ready to sell out. Lee Chow buys for $40,000. The fellas take your dust and vamoose, leaving Lee Chow with a deed to a vegetable farm. That's all it's good for. Well, does he know yet? Uh, if he don't, he's the only man in hell they ain't. Well, what about the men who sold the claim to him? Uh, last I heard, they was headed for California. Ah, uh, good morning, my friend Kendall. Good morning, Mr. Lee. You appear downcast. Is something the matter? Well, I've just heard some rather bad news. It's... Uh... It's about your claim. Oh? You've been cheated, Mr. Lee. There's no gold. The men who sold it to you knew it. So? But I, I do not understand. Yesterday, my boys who are working for me, they bring me a sack of dust. Here. See for yourself. It is the same as I have seen before. Your workers took this out of the claim? It is just as it has always been. I, I, I don't understand this talk of cheating. <laughs> Neither do I, Mr. Lee. Yeah, ah, here is my friend, Ji Ping. He very fine miner working for me. Good morning, Ji. Good morning, Lee. Good morning, honored sir. Good morning. My, uh, my friend here, Kendo, he's worried about the claim. You worried? Why? There is talk of uh, salting the mine. Then salt is of gold. Here, from work of yesterday. One ounce more than first day. Ah, uh, I do not know from where you hear this bad news, my friend Kendo. But if the rest of my life is as unfortunate... I shall indeed be a rich and happy man. Will you take a cup of tea with me? Perhaps a game of chess? A day or so later, I left Helena and didn't return for about three weeks. Then it was only to spend an hour or so arranging for transportation to Fort Benton. I went to the store of Mr. Lee Chow and found to my surprise that it was closed. I walked to the barber shop and over a hair trimming learned what had happened during my absence. Lee Chow! Mister, you whispered that name around these parts. 
Say, ain't I seen you before? Yes, I came in for a shave a few weeks ago. Yeah, never forget a face. Well, what about Lee Chow? Gone. China, they say. Well, what happened? So I claim of his. Oh, well, I'm glad to hear it. Yeah, maybe you are, but there's a passel of fellas around here who ain't. You know what that son of a gun did? What? Salted his mind. So, ain't that what? something? Everybody figuring Lee Chow an honest man, and he salts a mine. Shows you. Well, how? I mean, uh, I thought the claim had turned out to be good. What do you what do you call it? A bonanza? Yeah, that's what everybody thought. You know what he was doing? Every day he had one of his coolies bring in a sack of dust, made sure people saw it. After a while, a fellas begun figuring that Lee really had struck pay dirt. A couple of them went into Lee's place, showed him a sack of dust. He showed it to me. Sure he did. And he had one other sack. That's all I had. When he kept it in the store, the other he'd give back oh, the coolie and bring it in the next day. <laughs> uh, it ain't nothing to laugh at, mister. You know what he done? <laughs> no, I haven't any, any idea. Sold all that worthless bit of ground for 100000 <laughs> Yes, sir, 100000 then skips off <laughs> to China. <laughs> Biggest swindle ever seen in the territory. <laughs> Fellas who bought it found <laughs> out the next day. They I have thought of the outlaw, Dick Gillis, and the interview I had with him in Virginia City. He had been convicted of holding up the stage and the murder of two men. We talked in his cell, the marshal sitting outside at his desk, keeping a watchful eye on us. Gillis was quite proud to be the subject of an English newspaperman's report. Perhaps he colored his life for that reason. I'll never be quite sure. I'm 36. 36 years out of a mother's arms I never knew. She went up Salt River when I was born, Abby. My pa, he were a wicked old so-and-so, used to beat the tar out of me. I run away from home when I was ten. Where did you go? Nebraska, Kansas, Colorado. I've been all over. I've seen more than most men see in five lifetimes. Less than I wish I had. What made you start just being an outlaw? Man doesn't start, mister. Shucks, I was born outlaw. Did my first killing when I was ten. Shot me my pa's horse. That's how come I run away. Well, why did you shoot his horse? I don't know. Because I guess the old varmint cared more for horse flesh than for his own son, maybe. I sure hated that critter. If I hadn't killed the horse, I'd have killed the old man. Now, that's for sure. How many men have you killed? In fair fight, two. No matter telling it now, because I'm going to hang anyway. Seven. Seven I killed in hate, for killing's sake. Do you have a girl? I got a wife. Ain't seen her for three years now. There's a kid, too. But I never did go back. I guess it's how they'll manage along. You know, a man like me oughtn't take up with a wife and her kids. There's something more fired wrong. Wrong? A fella like me, I know I done bad. I know I'm going to hang. There ain't no one going to sorrow. Kind of wish that weren't so. What do you think? I know what you mean. If I had me a 44, I'd shoot my way out of here and I'd head for the hills and live, you know? Funny how quick a man forgets the smell of grass and sage. I should have been one of them poet fellas. I, I knew Jack Crawford once. You ever meet up with him? No. I'd like to ask you a favor, mister. What is it? You write what I'm telling you in that English paper of yours. You say maybe somebody sorrowed when I got my neck broke, huh? Make it up maybe like my wife or kid heard and they sorrowed. I will. Day comes when man gets to be alone. Ain't nothing more to look at except what's inside. <laughs> I sure had not to kill that horse, you know. These are some of the things which I've seen, heard during my travels. I find myself despondent at the thought of leaving this country and its people, yet my sadness is tempered with the realization that perhaps someday I shall come back to the great American West, which for the past several months has been my home. Tom 
Gums are fast, effective, and safe. Gums relieve the discomfort of acid indigestion quickly with no danger of acid rebound, sometimes caused by harsh alkalizers. Always carry Tums, 10 cents. Three-roll pack, a quarter. New six-roll pack with free metal carrier, 49 cents. Frontier Gentlemen was written, produced, and directed by Anthony Ellis and stars John Daner as J.B. Kendall. Featured in the cast were Ben Wright, Virginia Gregg, Lawrence Dobkin, Joseph Kearns, Vic Perrin, Jack Crucian, Jack Moyles, and Harry Bartell. Bud Sewell speaking. CBS Caution Before Speed. This is the CBS Radio Network.